Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this Sabbath day. We thank you for this time that we can come together and consider your word. Um, we thank you for your word and thank you for the way that you are enlightening our minds to um, the things around us and, uh, and how they relate to the things that you have given us in this word. I pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will be with us now as we um, seek to understand these things. Um, and may your spirit abide with us um, beyond this camp meeting and may our studies continue uh, with diligence and we all come to understand our role in uh, the events uh, at, here at the end of the world and, uh, and may we all play our part in um, this mighty work to, to finalize events here on earth. Um, please Lord be with us through the rest of the day. Keep our minds fixed on you and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, <clears throat> um, back in my first presentation, this is how we started, um, and I thought that we'd do a, uh, a quick review of, of that first day, and since there are some people here that um, weren't here for, for the, the presentations through the week, um, it would be handy um, for the remainder of my presentation in, in wrapping up some of the things that we had a look at. So we saw that there was a, a parallel um, in, in, with the mindset of a parable. God gave us an example of the things that were happening in heaven with a, um, a, a system here on earth. So we have the earthly sanctuary is to give us an understanding of what's happening in heaven where, where Christ is, where God is. So, this being the, the sanctuary in heaven, and here on earth, at the creation the way that God intended. And I've just taken some snippets um, from uh, that first paper and uh, we'll see uh, quite quickly uh, where we went um, focusing on the, the important points um, but yeah this first quote from um, Christian Education um, describes the, the first students on earth who were of course Adam and Eve and it reads the holy pair Adam and Eve were not only children under the fatherly care of God but students receiving instruction from the all wise creator they were visited by angels and were granted communion with their maker with no obscuring veil. So this, this was the condition of things before the fall of humanity and it's the way that God intended it and uh, it's the way it is with uh, all other beings um, that he has created. That there is uh, direct communion uh, with God uh, and, his, um, and his creation. But we know that that's not the way things stayed here on earth. Adam and Eve fell and, uh, and as a result there was a need of a, a veil separating the, the holy place from the most holy place. And um, facilitating our continued communication with heaven um, but there was a need of um, of an intercessor um, between us and the Father. And from Patriarchs and Prophets we read that after the fall, after the expulsion of Adam and Eve from Eden, that the Garden of Eden remained upon the earth long after man had become an outcast from its pleasant paths. At the cherubim guarded gate of Paradise, the divine glory was revealed. Hither came Adam and his sons to worship God. So, this covenant that we in the, the men's Sabbath school were discussing um, involved this plan of salvation for humanity, which needed a, an addition to the sanctuary here on earth 
and um, we won't go into the pillars but there are these four pillars at the outside of the Garden of Eden. Man was expelled um, from the Garden of Eden out into the, the, the world and so we have Adam and Eve <coughs> here on the outside with um, this quote telling us that the glory of God was still manifest at the gates to the spiritual sanctuary and they could still have communion with the Father, uh, with God, <coughs> through the veil that is illustrated uh, on the sanctuary layout. <coughs> Um, from Christ's object lessons we read Christ was as much okay this is Christ's object lessons page 126.2 Christ was as much man's redeemer in the beginning of the world okay Christ was as much man's redeemer at the beginning of the world as he is today before he clothed his divinity with humanity and came to our world the gospel message was given to Adam, Seth, Enoch, Methuselah and Noah Abraham in Canaan and Lot in Sodom bore the message and from generation to generation faithful messengers proclaimed the coming one. So that's what we were saying about these, these pillars, these pillars that were a combination of um, human and divine. They were a wooden pillar with um, precious metals top and bottom. So this is the idea of a combination of the, the common with the, the precious. And, uh, and these were the people pointing towards God and the, and the way to God, back to God. Um, pointing out the need of a saviour, which is the, the, the sacrifice that's facilitated on this um, altar of sacrifice. <coughs> which we read about in Signs of the Times, December 23, 1886, uh, with the altar of sacrifice. Um, these two brothers, Cain and Abel, represent the whole, family, uh, the whole human family. They were both tested on the point of obedience, and all will be tested as they were. Um, so we know the, the events around uh, this test of Cain and Abel was around um, the sacrifice, uh, which was pointing towards the sacrifice needed um, by Christ for, for our sake. <coughs> and then moving into the sanctuary we had the laver. Paul's going to keep busy. <laughs> um, <coughs> the laver from Gospel Workers, um, page 162. What what impression was this to make upon the people? It was to show them that every particle of dust must be put away before they could go into the presence of God. For he was so highly, high and holy that unless they did comply with these conditions, death would follow. So the, the lesson to the people of the, uh, the labour was the necess necessity of um, cleanliness, um, uh, no sin, on the part of the, the priests as they moved into the, into the sanctuary. And if we consider this walk through the sanctuary as a, a walk through human history, we'll see parallels to um, the various events uh, in the gospel um, and the, the elements of the sanctuary uh, give us understanding of, of what, uh, what is happening in history. So for humanity to fully appreciate what's happening uh, here in the sanctuary, they needed to have a, an object lesson. Um, and this 
experience of Cain and Abel give the, gave them this experience in the, the sacrificial um, service. And then we have the, the flood um, represented by the labour. And so once they've had this experience, they're drawn into the sanctuary and we, <coughs> if we illustrate the Jews, the Jewish nation. Um, so if we, if we mark covenant at this point, the, the covenant that Noah um, had with God uh, as he left the ark, we had the, the first thing that he did was to um, build an altar and, uh, and we had the symbol of the, the rainbow um, being covenant between um, God and man. So the, the labor, and I'll put humanity here as the, the Jewish nation. And um, at this point here, we have um, five pillars, which can be paralleled to the, the five books of Moses. Um, Moses um, being the prophet God used to, to point the way into the, the sanctuary and the, the ordinances that were practiced in the sanctuary service um, allowed humanity to, to look by faith uh, into the sanctuary. So, in Desire of Ages, um, concerning this door into the holy place, <coughs> So humanity is moving in through the sanctuary. Now pride and envy close the door against the light. This is um, desire of ages. This is describing the experience of the Jews um, around the time of Christ. And <clears throat> what she's describing here is the, the, the attitude of the Jews um, around the birth of Christ and the, the stubbornness of them in accepting him as the saviour. Now pride and envy close the door against the light. If the reports brought by the shepherds and the wise men were credited, they would place the priests and rabbis in a most unenviable position, disproving their claim to be the exponents of the truth of God. From this point, their pride and stubbornness grew into a settled hatred of the Saviour. While God was opening the door to the Gentiles, the Jewish leaders were closing the door to themselves. So at the time of Christ, um, at the time of Christ, the, the, um, the, the the typical service was meeting, sorry, the, the typical service was meeting the antitype. Um, the death of Christ opened this doorway um, into the sanctuary. And the, uh, I'll back up just a, a, a moment. Remember I placed Adam, Adam to Noah as being the people, various people, uh, during the antediluvian period, pointing into the sanctuary. And if we place Moses and all the prophets of the Old Testament through to Christ, um, pointing forward to what was to happen in here. And when the sanctuary service was um, abolished, the, the veil here is rent. Um, making it clear that the, the typical service was finished. Christ uh, was crucified and ascended to the sanctuary in heaven. And this is where we are to look to him by faith as he is in interceding for us. So 
God is opening this door to humanity, to the Gentiles, um, to all humanity actually. But the Jews, by their attitude towards the Saviour, were closing the door to themselves. So, I'll read a little more about that. In early writings, we have a, a two paragraphs. Satan rejoiced that, sorry, this is early writings, page 209. Satan rejoiced that the Jews were safe in his snare. They still continued their useless forms, their sacrifices and ordinances. As Jesus hung upon the cross and cried, it is finished, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to bottom to signify that God would no longer meet with the priests in the temple to accept their sacrifices and ordinances and also to show that the partition wall between the Jews and the Gentiles was broken down. Jesus had made an offering of himself for both, and if saved at all, both must believe in him as the only offering for sin, the saviour of the world. In the second paragraph, the rending of the veil of the temple showed that the Jewish sacrifices and ordinances would no longer be received. The great sacrifice had been offered and had been accepted. And the Holy Spirit, which descended on the day of Pentecost, carried the minds of the disciples from the earthly sanctuary to the heavenly, where Jesus had entered by his own blood to shed upon his disciples the benefits of his atonement. But the Jews were left in total darkness. They lost all the light which they might have had upon the plan of salvation and still trusted to their useless sacrifices and offerings. The heavenly sanctuary had taken the place of the earthly, yet they had no knowledge of the, t of the change. Therefore, they could not be benefited by the mediation of Christ in the holy place. So it was necessary for, the, for all humanity, which is a Christian experience, to move into the sanctuary, to have communion with, with Christ, as he is in the heavenly sanctuary. <clears throat> so the Jews chose to remain out here um, they had their eyes fixed on the pillars, which is Moses, of course, rather than moving by faith uh, into the sanctuary. Uh, and we have this veil. Again, a series of pillars. <coughs> We'll talk a little about the veil. Yes, yeah, Spirit of Prophecy, um, Volume 2, page 122. <clears throat> Christ was the foundation and life of that temple. His crucifixion would virtually destroy it because its services were typical of the future sacrifice of the Son of God. They pointed to the great antitype, which was Christ himself. When the Jews should ex accomplish their wicked purpose and do unto him what they listed, from that day forth sacrificial offerings and the service connected with them would be valueless in the sight of God. For type would have met antitype in the perfect offering of the Son of God. The whole priesthood was established to represent the mediatorial character and work of Christ in the, the heavenly sanctuary and the entire plan of sacrificial worship was a foreshadowing of the death of the saviour to redeem the world from sin there would be no more need of burnt offerings and the blood of beasts would uh, sorry the blood of beasts when the great event toward which they had pointed for ages was consummated the temple was christ its service and ceremonies referred directly to him what there must have been his feelings when he found it polluted by the spirit of avarice and extortion, a place of merchandise and traffic. When Christ was crucified, the inner veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to bottom. This offence signified that the ceremonial system of the sacrificial offerings was at an end forever, that the one great and final sacrifice was made in the Lamb of God slain for the sins of the world.
One thing I forgot to mention, <clears throat> I mentioned the rainbow. It's a, a symbol of the, the covenant with humanity after the flood. And we could mark the, the Ten Commandments, the two tables as a, a symbol of the, the covenant <clears throat> at this place. Um, Christ's ministration. This is Patriarchs and Prophets, page 353. In the offering of incense, the priest was brought more directly into the presence of God than in any other act in the daily ministration. As in that typical service, the priest looked by faith to the, to the mercy seat, which he could not see. So the people of God are now to direct their prayers to Christ. The great high priest, who unseen by human vision, is pleading in their behalf in the sanctuary above. So you'll remember... Uh, where should I do it? I'll do it up on. This is a side view of the sanctuary. And it's, it's saying that this, um, <laughs> this veil didn't go all the way to the roof. And the priest would stand in front of the altar, pardon my artwork, and would look by faith into the most holy place to, to where the presence of God was. And that's our job, even though spiritually we're here, we're to look to Christ who is interceding for us in the, in the, the heaven above, the sanctuary above. Um, okay. uh, inside the most holy place we had the Ark of the Covenant um, this is the mystery of mercy into which the angels desire to look that God can be just while he justifies the repenting sinner and renews his intercourse with the fallen race that Christ could stoop to raise unnumbered multitudes from the abyss of ruin and clothe them with the spotless garments of his own righteousness, to unite with angels who have never fallen and to dwell forever in the presence of God. Okay, and uh, I pointed out um, during the week that this is the daily service and this is the yearly service, so once a year service in the, the most holy place. Which is the, the Day of Atonement, which us as Adventists are, are familiar with. The, the Day of Atonement. The blood of Christ, this is from Patriarchs and Prophets, page 357. The blood of Christ, while it was to release the repentant sinner from the condemnation of the law, was not to cancel the sin. It would stand on record in the sanctuary until the final atonement. So in the type, the blood of the sin offering removed the sin from the penitent, but it rested in the sanctuary until the day of atonement. So in the, the sacrificial system, the lamb would be slain um, and the blood would be brought um, into the sanctuary and <coughs> It represented the sins being brought onto the sanctuary and there was, of course, required a day of atonement to remove the sins from the sanctuary. And Christ, being the Lamb, when he ascended to the heavenly sanctuary, he took our sins with him. And so there is a need of cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary from uh, our sins, which we as Adventists know to be the cleansing of the sanctuary at the end of the 2300 days. <clears throat> the third angel's message. As, as they reviewed their experience, this is the Millerites, as they reviewed their experience from the first proclamation of the second advent to the passing of the time in 1844, they saw their disappointment explained and hope and joy again animated their, their hearts. Light from the sanctuary illuminated the past, the present, and the future, and they knew that God had led them by his unerring providence. So here we have 
Christ in the heavenly sanctuary moving into the most holy place and we as Adventists are supposed to move by faith with Christ into the most holy place. Um. <clears throat> And at that time, we had a symbol of the covenant also as, as God moved out of covenant, covenant with one group of people, the Christian church, into covenant with the Adventist church. And the, the, the tables that we have, uh, the tables that you see behind us here, the prophetic tables that are the symbol of the covenant. <clears throat> and the whole purpose of this whole system is to get us back to where we were before. <laughs> um, so, Regaining Eden. This is um, the book uh, Conflict, page 15. Sin drove man from paradise, and sin was the cause of the removal of paradise from the earth. In consequence of transgression of God's law, Adam lost paradise. In obedience to the Father's law and through faith in the atoning blood of his Son, paradise may be regained. Repentance towards God because his law has been transgressed and faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ as man's only Redeemer uh, will be accepted with God. Notwithstanding man's sinfulness, the merits of God's dear Son in his behalf will avail with the Father. So, understanding this, um, this service and participating in that service, which is what we've been going through during the week, um, uh, comparing the, the sanctuary layout with the book Steps to Christ, uh, gives us an understanding of the steps uh, we need to take uh, in participating with, with Christ uh, in the plan of salvation. So I hope this has been a benefit, and I forgot to mark, as far as these, these pillars go between the holy place and the most holy, we had, you can, you can, you can um, compare them to the, the four Gospels, which are pointing towards uh, the most holy place, or I think it's broader than that. And I would mark John um, down to, down to our prophet Ellen White, who is, who has given great clarity to the role of Christ uh, in the heavenly sanctuary. <coughs> okay. So that's the review of that first day. And um, I wanted to also finish um, the last couple of steps from Steps to Christ. If you have your, your notes from those studies, it's called um, Steps in the Sanctuary. Yeah, do you have it there? Yeah. <clears throat> okay. So, is everybody happy if I rub this off?
so we got up to chapter chapter number uh, number 11 <coughs> yesterday when we finished up and If you remember, I portrayed a few things in the, the holy place here. Sister White described the, the various <coughs> elements in the, the chapter called um, Tests of Discipleship, elements that were necessary for growth, and I placed sunshine here with the, the candlestick, uh, food. Here with the table of showbread, which of course had the, the two loaves, uh, the two piles of loaves, or six loaves. And, um, and I suggested air being represented by the uh, altar of incense. I placed us here. And just to make a distinction, what I showed before was um, <clears throat> a, a look at the sanctuary as far as the whole history of humanity goes. This is more a look at the sanctuary as far as our individual walk goes. Um, so it doesn't necessarily correlate. So I placed us here in, in the holy place, uh, in our role as, as priests. And, um, and I attached the chapter called The Work and the Life. I'll put it up top. And then we had the chapter called The Knowledge of God, which I lined up with the, the veil here. And the final ch chapter that we had a look at was um, pretty certain the privilege of prayer. which I lined up with the, um, the altar of incense. So, just to round off the, the whole study, I just wanted to touch on the, the last couple of chapters and read these uh, couple of paragraphs that I've got and then I was wanting to have a closer look at uh, the most holy place and some of the elements uh, in it and what it might have to say um, for us uh, today um, what to do with doubt <clears throat> not as clear as I was hoping it would be um, but I hope you remember we laid over the, the three angels messages the one two three and we pointed out from Revelation 14 you um, have a, a doubling at the second angel 
and we had here one, two and three for the, the elements in this outer court and I had attached here the, the, the two chapters called Repentance and Confession and, um, and for this second part of the uh, holy place being the one, two and the three um, we had tests of discipleship and growing up into Christ <coughs> And these two chapters here, Privilege of Prayer and What to Do with Doubt, um, I lined up with the second part of this um, most holy place being the uh, altar of incense or the, the, the censer. <coughs> so it occurred to me after going through the study, it all seemed to line up and then we got to this second last chapter which, if it's correct, well on in the, um, in the layout of the sanctuary, and we had this chapter called What to Do with Doubt, how you could get to this point in the sanctuary and, um, and still be struggling with doubt. Um, but from Christ, uh, Steps to Christ we read, Disguise it as they may, the real cause of doubt and scepticism in most cases is the love of sin. The teaching and restrictions of God's word are not welcome to the proud, sin-loving heart. And those who are unwilling to obey its requirements are ready to doubt its authority. In order to arrive at truth, we must have a sincere desire to know the truth and a willingness uh, of heart to obey it. And all who come in this spirit to the study of the Bible will find abundant evidence that it is God's word and they may gain an understanding of its truths that will make them wise unto salvation. There is an evidence that is open to all, the most highly educated and the most illiterate, the evidence of experience. So this is an evidence that the, the closing scenes of our walk through the sanctuary, uh, a strong evidence that she's pointing out here is our experience, and it's an experience with the Lord. God invites us to prove for ourselves the, re the reality of his word, the truth of his promises. He bids us taste and see that the Lord is good. Instead of depending upon the word of another, we are to taste for ourselves. He declares, ask and ye shall receive. His promises will be filled. They, will never f they have never failed and they never can fail. And as we draw near to Jesus and rejoice in the fullness of his love, our doubt and darkness will disappear in the light of his presence. So wonderful words of encouragement for, for, for this part of our experience. <clears throat> and the final chapter of Steps to Christ is, <clears throat> is titled Rejoicing in the Lord. And I've only got a, a very short paragraph here. It, um, it seemed fairly self-explanatory. So, from rejoicing in the Lord and steps to Christ, angels are listening to hear what kind of report you are bearing to the world about your heavenly master. Let your conversation be of him who liveth to make intercession for you before the Father. When you take the hand of a friend, let praise to God be on your lips and in your heart. This will attract his thoughts to Jesus. And this is a study you can do into the, the power of what Sister White describes as mind on mind. Um, this is the way the enemy worked in heaven, um, but it's, um, it's a, a tool intended by the Lord to, to bring people to him. And, uh, and it's just communion between between people um, but she specifies here that angels are listening to hear what kind of report <clears throat> and as we had one two and three and I had here one two and three for the three angels messages so here in the most holy place we've got one two and three 
and um, this rejoicing in the Lord, you would line up with, with judgment. Remember we had sin, righteousness and judgment. Um, uh, so this, this is the judgment. This whole experience here is a probationary experience. And the way it is judged is that everything, um, our interactions uh, with humanity uh, are recorded. We know that we have uh, the books of record in heaven. And um, this record of our experience lets the Lord know, lets the, the universe know, if, um, if there has been any growth in our spiritual experience. Okay, so that's round. I've lost batteries. I think the batteries are dead. <clears throat> Try that. That looks okay. Try that. I'll drop out again. Closer. A closer? Not too close. Not too close. Okay. Thank you, brother. So this, this portion of what I wanted to present is um, actually really more of a, um, a throwing it out to you guys. Um, there's some elements in the, in the most holy place that are interesting. Um, I can't say that I have a great understanding of it, um, but I'll give you my thoughts and, uh, and hopefully it's, um, it's just a uh, stimulates your sanctified curiosity to, to go out and study these things more. Um, so, if I can find my notes. <clears throat> okay, so just down to Aaron's Road. Okay. <laughs> so, um, throughout the last study from Seps to Christ, <clears throat> we lined up these three elements in the various apartments. And when humanity is in the outside here, we had these prophets, these holy men of God, pointing towards what was happening inside the sanctuary, what they had to understand about the sacrificial system and, and, uh, and baptism, uh, uh, an object lesson in baptism. And then humanity moved forward, and then they have Moses, standing here pointing towards what's happening on the inside of the sanctuary. So humanity's out here pointing towards what's happening inside. Then we have the Christian dispensation and we have John and all of the, the prophets uh, around his time pointing towards, as humanity's out here, these prophets are pointing towards what's happening inside. They've got this repeating pattern. And it occurred to me that Uh, 
that we have elements inside the, the most holy place that are that Christ is pointing towards something that we need to look to, something that we can't see, that we need to see by faith. And this is the final apartment. But can anybody tell me the, the things that we have here uh, in the Ark of the Covenant? What was in the, the Ark of the Covenant? Ten Commandments? <clears throat> was that the only thing? <coughs> Say again. Aaron's rod. Amen. Was it Aaron's rod and the last thing? What about? Whatever it looked like. So. We have Aaron's rod. Um, what's significant about Aaron's rod? What happened with Aaron's rod? It budded. It's interesting that the Bible tells us that it, it budded, it blossomed, and it bore fruit. So we have again three things that happened to this element of the sanctuary. So we have one two, three. So we've got this dead dry stick, similar to the, um, the pillars that we've got out here, just a piece of wood that has something happened to it that's, that's not natural, that is divine. Um, so we have this parallel between these pillars here with, with Aaron's rod. And if we have a look at the, the holy place here, We've got this pot of bread which lines up with the, the table of uh, showbread in, in the holy place. And then 